Hey Blake, do you remember that time that NASA killed seven astronauts and destroyed a space shuttle through malfeasance? Which one? <laughs> I knew that would be your answer. <laughs> We're going to talk about the first time they did it. Okay, so that would be the Challenger. Yeah. So Challenger was in 1986. It was in January of that year. So I'm going to have to work really hard to remember because I was only two and a half at the time. So it's going to be a little bit of a struggle to recall all of these details. And in a strange coincidence, we're recording this podcast on the anniversary of the day that it exploded. Yeah. Not on purpose. Yeah, I guess uh, 32 years ago today. Mm hmm. What do you know about this, Blake? Just that O-rings were involved. Well, if you're going to ask... You know, all the details. Yeah, O-rings, cold temperatures. There was a bureaucratic process at NASA that didn't really... It wasn't designed for success. Yeah, that's about it. Yeah. So I, I think that's about what most people take away from it at this point. And I would wonder if we have older listeners who know more about this, who recall it from the time. Because I bet a lot of these lessons are kind of lost on people our age and younger. If we're just too young to appreciate this, we we have no re actual recollection of it. And so none of it made an impression on us because we just didn't remember it. Yeah. So what happened is the Challenger disintegrated on ascent to orbit at about 73 seconds after launch. And after that happened... They started reviewing the footage at the beginning of the investigation to, into what went wrong. And the first kind of weird thing they noticed are these puffs of smoke. And it was when the vehicle was still on the launch pad, the solid rocket boosters, which are these, these two disposable boosters that are on the side, they had black smoke puffing out of them. And... They noticed that this black smoke was puffing out at a frequency of about 4 hertz. And the natural frequency of the entire shuttle stack, the orbiter, the external tank, and the two solid rocket boosters sitting on the launch pad, is about 4 hertz. And when they're doing the countdown sequence to launch the shuttle, they get to 6.6 .6 seconds before launch. And that's when the main engines ignite, not the solid rocket boosters, but the main engines. They ignite and they come up to full throttle. And there's all these diagnostics that the computers are doing on them at the time. And the whole stack is being held down to the launch pad by a bunch of explosive bolts, which at zero seconds explode and the solid rocket boosters ignite and the whole stack starts to ascend. So... During this time period from 6.6 .6 seconds before the launch until the launch at zero seconds, the entire stack tips forward because you suddenly have all the thrust of the main engines throttled up to max, pressing on the stack, and it's not in line with the holddown bolts. So the entire stack wobbles a little bit. And when you see this on film, it, it appears as if it wobbles nose down a bit and then it sits back up and when that happens it induces a four hertz vibration on the entire system from that kind of twang from the the engines throttling up and and pressing the stack forward and then the stack kind of springing back to the fully upright position okay so they they noticed this black smoke coming out of one of the joints in the solid rocket booster and it's puffing out at about four hertz. And, and they, they thought, well, that's obviously not supposed to happen. <laughs> and so they keep looking at, you know, the, the slow motion film of, of the orbiter as it was ascending past the launch pad. And these puffs of smoke stop after about T plus two seconds or so. So the puffs stopped. And then the orbiter starts ascending and it does its its rollover that it does and its pitch program and everything to get into the correct alignment to fly to orbit. And it gets up to about 62 seconds or so. And on the footage, they see that there was flame now coming out of the solid rocket booster. Like additional flame coming out of the side, right? 
Yes, flame. <laughs> yeah, let me let let's be explicit. Thanks for that. Yeah. Unintended flame coming out of the solid rocket booster, not the intentional flame coming out the back. Unintended flame coming out the side of the booster, apparently at one of the joints of the solid rocket booster, and impinging on the external tank of the space shuttle, which is this, you know, it's the huge orange tank in the center, and it, it holds all of the liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen that the main engines on the shuttle are burning during the ascent. So all through this ascent, the fuel is being pumped from that tank into the shuttle to the shuttle's engines to burn. And so now you have this flame coming out of the solid rocket booster side and hitting the external tank. And that begins again about 62, 63 seconds or so. And at about 73 seconds, as they're they're examining the film, the whole stack breaks up. So when you watch a normal speed version of the film, it looks like it's flying along, and then the whole thing just kind of disintegrates. There are still some large pieces. The two solid rocket boosters fly free and and they don't really have their much of a guidance system of their own separate of the whole stack. They do have a little bit of ability in their nozzles to maneuver, but not enough to really control themselves in any useful way. So they they just kind of go off like like bottle rockets and the whole stack just appears to disintegrate in about a quarter of a second. So these solid rocket boosters became the focus of the investigation. And the way that these boosters are built, they're made out of 11 segments. And these segments are built up, they're, they're filled with this solid fuel at Morden Thiokol's facility in Utah. And then they're shipped by train to Florida. So you, you start with 11 segments, and something like seven of these segments, I believe, are identical. They're just big cylindrical segments. They're about 21 feet across and I want to say about 25 feet tall. And they're packed with solid rocket fuel except for a, a gap down the center. And so Morden Thiokol would assemble some of these 11 together and then they would ship four pieces to NASA in Florida. For, like, assemblies of a couple of chunks? Correct. Okay. Correct. <clears throat> and so, Morden Thiokol had a, a way of describing this. They said that the joints that they connected at their factory were called plant joints, because they were done in the assembly plant. And then they would ship the bigger assembly pieces to NASA, and NASA would complete the last four pieces, putting those together. And those were called field joints. And so... As early as 1978, there were engineers who had raised concerns about the design of the field joints in the solid rocket boosters. Engineers from which side or both? I believe it was NASA. Okay. So the the way that these joints work, and it's it's going to be kind of difficult to describe this without a diagram, you can just go to Google and search for something like Challenger, Clevis, and Tang, and then do an image search on that, and you'll find a really good diagram of it. But the way these work is, you can imagine you have two of these big cylindrical pieces of the solid rocket booster, and you have to join them. So you have one sitting on the floor, and you've got the other rigged up on this overhead crane, and you're going to lower it down over the first one. And so if you imagine taking your left hand and you take your index and your thumb and you hold them like you would when you're describing something small and you're saying like it was this small you know you hold them like that that's what the clevis joint on the lower segment looked like it's what a cross section of it looked like and then if you imagine your right hand is the upper section and you just take your other index finger and you you kind of push that down into the U formed by the index and thumb finger on your left hand, that's how the, the tang section of the upper section worked. And so they slip together like this. And again, this is kind of representative of a cross section. And so you can imagine this, this kind of 
female you and the male Tang kind of slipped together and then rotated around the the central axis of the solid rocket booster. When I do this with my fingers, is it to scale? It, it's kind of to scale, yeah. Close enough. Okay. It, yeah, it's it's actually close. So it, it's not as if the clevis portion, the portion shaped like a U, it's not as if it was, you know, very, very, very deep for how wide it was. It, it, it is actually about like, you know, holding your fingers together like that to imagine it. Okay. You know. And then it's made out of steel? Steel, yes. Okay. And so when they assemble these, you, again, you, the lower section, the clevis section that's shaped like a U is on the floor and the upper section, the tang comes down on top of it and, and you have to fit the upper tang ring into the lower clevis ring all the way around the circumference of these sections of booster as you're assembling. It. Sounds easy enough. Yeah. And, and they're precision machined parts that have very, very little clearance. So if you go back to your, your model with your fingers and you imagine the uh, pad of your thumb, so that's the inside of the clevis. So the pad of your thumb had two grooves in it that again went circumferentially all the way around the solid rocket booster. And those two grooves are what held the O-rings. And... The way this was designed is you had this packing on the outside above the thumb that was outside of the clevis joint. It's on the interior of the solid rocket booster segment. You had this packing of this, let's see, it was a zinc chromate putty. And so it's this really high temperature putty. And it would be packed up against where the inner piece of the clevis, your thumb, meets the tang, your right hand index finger. And so it would be packed on top of that. Now, the idea was when you first fire the solid rocket booster, when it first ignites, that putty sees all the pressure from inside the solid rocket booster. And the putty will get kind of smashed up into that little bit of joint there. And it'll compress the air that may be in the gap in between the tang and the clevis, and it'll use that to actuate the O-ring. And what O-ring actuation means is it kind of presses the O-ring so it flattens out against the two sides, against the tang and the clevis, and it seals across them. And this was supposed to happen within the first half second after a solid rocket booster is ignited. So there, there are several problems already. One is the solid rocket boosters were reusable. And so they would be picked up after they fell in the ocean. They would be shipped back to Mordenthiacol in Utah. They would be taken apart, inspected, repaired, uh, refurbished, repacked with solid rocket fuel, and eventually shipped back to NASA to be used on another flight. So these Tang and Clevis joints would they would change size over time based on how many times they had been used from the stresses of the flight, the stresses of the pressure inside. And they were not the same after one flight as they were factory new. They weren't the same after two flights as after one flight and so on. So hmm. you could end up with parts trying to mate together that had different histories. And they may not fit very well. Did reusing the SRBs save NASA a lot of money? Not really. NASA's philosophy when it chose the SRBs was take something that's cheap to design, even if it has higher costs to use down the road, but just make the design portion cheap because we don't have much money and we got to get it designed. Mm. And so they... That, that was one of the criticisms in the investigation report was that they chose a design that was expensive to, to use per flight, and they chose it only because it was cheap to design up front. Is it still cheaper to refurbish those things? Because it seems like all you're really getting back from space is like some pipe segments. You could just make them again. 
you have to remember that the the idea of reusable space hardware was very popular at this time. I do remember. And they thought, they thought, yeah, we can do that. We can totally reuse the whole thing. And, you know, they, they sold the shuttle on the idea that it would be a reusable vehicle. You could fly this thing like every two weeks you could you could take it in orbiter and turn it around and launch it again mm-hmm. and then when they actually started getting some experience with it even before challenger was lost they realized these things are really a lot more complicated we probably can't turn them around faster than every six weeks or so and then after challenger was lost and they they had to confront the realities of what they were doing they ended up turning them around like every 16 weeks at at the fastest pace they would ever achieve again. Mm. And so there there was a lot of this this idea that you could just design hardware that was so good that you could reuse it over and over. The reality that set in was you have to spend a lot of time and money inspecting in between flights. And the amount of effort you spend on inspection eats up a lot of the savings. And you don't nearly save as much as you thought you were going to. Yeah, it makes sense. So, like I said, the, the the first big problem that you encounter with these SRB segments is that since they're reusable, they change shape and they change size over time. The second problem was when Morden Thiokol would ship them to NASA on trains, they would ship them horizontally instead of vertically. And so they're essentially laying on their side in some kind of cradle, but they would still kind of take a out of round set to them as they were being shipped and and it was a measurable amount i'm just i'm just imagining them shipping them with like a cement mixer motor keeping them rotating the entire time (laughs) ship them on a rotisserie (laughs) that that actually sounds like a nasa style solution to a problem (laughs) it's the largest rotisserie in the world and there's two so so NASA would have to sit them upright and apparently the fuel would kind of return to its shape and press the the metal body kind of back towards round and they would have to let them sit for a while but they they would still measure problems due to the shipping. So you 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 go to assemble these pieces that may not fit very well just from manufacturing tolerance tolerances from problems from reusing them, problems from shipping. And so there was never any certainty when they would assemble segments and do these field joints in Florida that they would go together right and not pinch an O-ring or press an O-ring out of its groove or bunch up an O-ring. As you know, if you can imagine that the top tang section comes in just a little bit crooked it would make contact with the o-ring at one point around the circumference initially and then as you pressed further in that that point would expand in both directions around the circle and you could imagine pressing the o-ring until on the opposite end of where you first made contact you would now have a wrinkle in the o-ring and so they were never sure that that wasn't happening so they had designed an inspection port and this inspection port came through the tang and exited right up against the inside portion of the clevis in between the two O-rings. And so what they could do is use this inspection port, and there was there was only one across around the circumference of, of each field joint. They could use this inspection point, pressurize it, and then do just this what's called a static leak decay test or a static pressure decay test. And what that is, is you have some system you need to hold pressure. So you charge it up to a high pressure and then you just put a gauge on it and you just watch the gauge for a long time and you see if the pressure is changing from a leak. Okay. And what this was designed to tell them was, did the O-rings get seated correctly when we put the field joint together? That sounds like it would catch most classes of failure. There were there were two problems with this test. The first one was, and, and somebody pointed this out as early as the late 1970s, when the whole shuttle program was still in, in design. 
they pointed out that when you're testing through that inspection port, the primary O-ring, the first one, the one that sees pressure all the time, it's being tested in the opposite direction that it's actually loaded up during flight. Yeah, okay. So during flight, the, the pressure is coming from inside the SRB and pressing that O-ring downwards. And during the, the leak test, the O-ring is getting pressed upwards from the pressure that you you charge up through that inspection port. And somebody pointed that out and said, you know, I'm we're not that concerned. We we think it's probably a still good, still a good test, but it's kind of bad form to have a test like that that doesn't really test it the way it's going to be used. What would you do instead though? Pressurize the entire SRB, you have or two segments together, and then like you build a giant cap for both of them, and then pressurize the inside with the fuel. Yeah, and and again, it's it's uh, that's a good question. It's what would you do instead? But uh, you know, the test kind of seems like it's valid. It's just it makes you uneasy as an engineer, right? Yeah. To look at that and to look at that and say they're pressurizing it in the wrong direction. And I, I think what really makes me uneasy about that is when when I think about it, I can't come up with a good problem that that should create, but I know that that doesn't mean there isn't a problem that that could create. Yeah. And so I'm, I, I worry myself with, with thinking, what am I missing here? Because I know it's not right. Yeah, so... And I'm just rationalizing that it's also not wrong. In one of these later podcasts, we're going to talk about how to be a better engineer or things we would have wished we knew when we came out of college about engineering. And that specifically is one of the things that I want to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. Even if you cannot explicitly identify what's wrong with the setup, it makes you uneasy knowing that it's not right, too. Mm -hmm. So the second problem with this 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 inspection port and this leak test that they would do is imagine that the secondary O-ring, the one on bottom, imagine it had seated correctly during installation of the tang joint into the clevis. But imagine that the primary O-ring above it had not seated correctly and somewhere there was a gap, somewhere around the circumference of this joint, there was a gap. And now imagine that you do this leak test. What you're really up against is this zinc chromate putty. And so the zinc chromate putty was, again, it was packed in there between the, at, at the interface of the tang and the clevis on the inside of the SRB. And so if your primary O-ring had not seated correctly during insertion, you could actually be pressurizing against that putty and you wouldn't realize it because the putty was rather plastic. It was not, it was not like wet flowing putty the way we, we think of the word putty. Like you imagine Play-Doh or you imagine like clay you messed with in art class in junior high or something like that. You know, it, it was, it was a rather solid putty and it could hold some pressure. And so when you did this leak test, you may have a non-functioning primary O-ring and not be able to tell. So over time, NASA kind of, so you know, somebody raised that objection and they said, you know, we, we may not really know. And, and so NASA decided to increase the pressure of this static leak test. And initially it was 50 PSI that they would charge it up to. And they changed it to 100 PSI and then a little later, they changed it to 200 PSI. In retrospect, what the accident investigation found is that as they were doing that, they were actually blowing holes in the putty. And so the, the O-rings would not seal properly during construction so often that when they did the static leak tests, they would very commonly blow by the O-ring and damage the putty that they had packed in there. And so now you had putty with gaps in it, with holes and bubbles and and all of these really all of these 
structures in there that you meant to not have and that the engineers didn't understand. No one could predict where they were, and no one could predict what their effect during flight would be. But they were blowing holes in the putty after they increased the pressure of the static leak test. And as the Accident Investigation Committee found during their, their research, each time NASA increased the pressure, it exactly corresponded with increased damage in O-rings in field joints on recovered solid rocket boosters after they were flown. And so what was happening that no one picked up on before Challenger was lost was that the O-rings were getting more and more damaged and it corresponded, the, the rate of damage corresponded to the increases in the pressure of these leak checks. Mm. They're not reusing these O-rings, are they? No, they're not. So does that mean they were dependent on the engine achieving full pressure to reseal the putty? Yeah. One of the things that they believe happened is that those puffs of smoke in the first two seconds after liftoff, they believe those were the O-rings actually burning up that the black smoke coming out was the O-ring escaping, and that the putty was blasted into the gap afterwards. Something I think I'm not clear on is, so I'm under the impression that all these segments have fuel going all the way out to the edges. Like the entire, the SRB is, you can basically think of, of it as full of fuel except for a hole punched in the center. I know it's more complicated than that, but it, what I wonder about is, when you first light them, doesn't that mean that you have hot gases coming out of the center of the, the SRB, but then they'd be pressing the fuel up against the sides of the casing? Like, I would think the only thing interacting with a seam would be fuel under pressure, not, like, gases. Okay, so on these field joints... That's not the case. On the plant joints that Morden Thiokol made, that is the case. On the field joints, they have to, eventually the fuel has to end, right? Because you have the end of the, the metal body. Oh, okay. And, and what they would do is they would imagine you were pouring this in, and, and this really, this is not the manufacturing method they use, but imagine you were just pouring the solid rocket fuel into the the segment mm -hmm. at the plant you would you would fill it up and it would harden and then at the top of that segment you would place a layer of insulation mm -hmm. and so the segment that would eventually get lowered on top of it has a layer of insulation and then it has fuel above that and so at the circumference of this joint you have on top you have a layer of insulation on bottom you have a layer of insulation and there's a tiny gap and at the edge of that gap around the circumference is where that that putty is packed okay and so you do have a direct pathway for pressurized gas to meet that putty even in the first second upon lighting the solid rocket booster okay that's something i i never knew about this and i always wondered why would hot gas be impinging on the seal? Yeah. That seems like just optimally bad. Yeah. And so the putty is there, and it's it's a very high temperature putty. It's designed to keep the gas from hitting the O-ring, and it's designed to, under the pressure of the gas upon ignition, it's designed to flow into the joint to a degree and pressurize the air that's in the joint above the first O-ring and then that air acts as a ram to actuate the first O-ring, flatten it out so that it's pressing against the left and the right side of the, the, the tang and clevis joint. Okay. And so it's kind of a complicated process, and, and all of this has to go off perfectly in about a half a second. So you had one other additional problem that came out of the design, and that is if you, if you go back to your model of your fingers... And, you know, you imagine your thumb is on the inside of the, the solid rocket booster, uh, your left hand thumb, and your left hand index finger is on the outside. And now 
you take the the two palms of your hands and you bend them towards each other and you imagine that these solid rocket booster segments are flexing about the joint that's what they thought would happen when they built the design they thought that when they lit the rocket initially the the transient flex on the whole structure would cause that tongue and clevis bit to press outwards while the wall of the segment above and below stayed the same shape. And they thought that again because there's a direct path of gas coming to the joint in between these segments. Yeah. And and they thought that when that happened, if you if you look at how your fingers bend when you make your palms kind of go towards each other, it should press close that gap between the pad of your thumb where the two o-ring channels are and your right hand index finger which is the tang it should press those closer together and help seal that joint and they were expecting that when they built the design so when they actually did their first test firing what they found is that the opposite happened so in effect the the palms of your hand bend away from each other and your thumb comes away from your index finger And so that gap between the inner portion of the clevis and the tang, right where the O-rings are riding, that gap actually opens up in that first half-second transient event upon lighting the solid rocket boosters. Hmm. And so now the O-ring has to seal a bigger gap than they had designed for. And when they discovered this, they went to NASA and they talked about it, and they were like, yeah, we've we kind of got a problem, you know, it opens up, but we think the O-rings have enough resiliency. And what they mean by resiliency is the O-rings can flow and change sh- shape fast enough. So, you know, if you if you imagine taking a piece of rubber and you just press your thumb into it and you deflect the rubber and then you remove your thumb real quick and there there's some amount of time it takes for that rubber to pop back to its original shape. And that's its resiliency. It's if it's very resilient, it will pop back very quickly. And if it's not resilient, it'll it'll hold that impression of your thumb longer. So Morden Thiokol and NASA said, we think these O-rings have enough resiliency that even though that gap opens up and we're now asking more of the O-rings than we thought we were originally, we think it's okay. Just keep on with the design. It's fine. And Morden Thiokol had charts of how much that gap would open over time for the first O-ring and the secondary O-ring. Because again, they'll open different amounts as that that flex happens. The primary O-ring will see a larger increase in the gap than the secondary O-ring. And Morden Thiokol thought, eh, we, it's okay, it's not a big deal. We, the design is robust enough. So... You've, you've got all those effects going on. You've got difficulty in assembling this thing right, difficulty in checking it out and making sure that it's working correctly. You have arguably a pretty bad design. Now you have the problem of actually putting this thing in flight condition. So when the whole solid rocket booster is strapped to the shuttle stack and you're flying this thing, it's not just sitting there static like we've kind of imagined it up till now. The whole system is now vibrating. It's It has all kinds of different vibrational modes. It has like pogo vibrations and it has longitudinal vibrations and, and lateral vibrations. And, and so you have all these different effects that will now happen on this tang and clevis joint. And one of those things that will happen is that again, that four hertz vibration from the whole shuttle stack tipping when the main engines light at minus 6.6 seconds and throttle up the max. And that's where they think that those black puffs of smoke came from. They think that the whole thing was vibrating at that frequency and with just that extra amount of vibration, it was enough gap to allow blow-by past the O-ring And as the gas blows past it, it burns up the O-ring. If the gas is being stopped by the O-ring, it 
won't burn it up as fast. It will eventually burn it up. But once you get a flowing stream of gas past the O-ring, it really burns it up fast. And so that's what they think those puffs of smoke were and why they were observed at 4 hertz, is that it was it was a result of that natural vibration of the whole stack at that time in the flight. Okay. So the thing launches, and they believe, again, that that putty eventually got blown into that gap and sealed it. Now, that's not how the design is supposed to work. The O-rings are supposed to always seal. And so you can consider that the SRB had already failed. It had not achieved its design. It just had not failed catastrophically at this point. And I guess this never happened before because it would have been noticed on inspection, right? They had seen O-ring blow by before. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now, they had not seen, I think, O-ring blow by on the pad. And and there's there's good reasons for those things. And and I'll get to that down the road as we we talk about some other people involved in this and and things they did. So, the shuttle clears the the launch pad and it flies until about 62 seconds when on the video you can see a flame suddenly coming out of this joint in the same spot where smoke was coming out. It just so happens that a moment before that flame starts, the space shuttle was hit with what at the time was the largest crosswind ever experienced by a shuttle on a set. And so many people believe that that large crosswind basically knocked the putty loose or it flexed the structure enough that the putty was blown out and that's why the fire was now allowed to come out because the o-rings were gone they were both already burnt through and then the putty was dislodged and now you had a direct path for exhaust gas to escape through that joint how do they know about the crosswind because the computers the flight control computer responded to it the inertial sensor felt the crosswind and then the control computer said, hey, I just got blown, you know, sideways with some force. I need to counteract that. So I still end up at the appropriate spot in orbit. And then did it radio it to the ground? Yeah, that that was telemetered to the ground. Okay. So that gas is now coming out of that joint in the solid rocket booster. It's hitting the external tank. And it's hitting the external tank very close to the spot where the solid rocket booster is connected to the tank at the aft end. And so there were two joints where the solid rocket boosters were connected to the tank, one at the forward end and one at the aft. And so this fire was coming out close enough that it actually impinged on that joint as well as the tank. And so pretty soon it burns through the tank. It takes about eight or 10 seconds. And when it burns through the outside of the external tank, it also fails the hydrogen tank that's inside. So, you know, inside this external tank, you've got a large hydrogen tank on bottom and you've got a smaller oxygen tank on top. And this flame burned through the hydrogen tank. So now the hydrogen tank is compromised. And when that gets compromised, what happens is it's a big pressurized vessel and it has to be pressurized so that it can feed fuel to the engines fast enough. Mm -hmm. When it's compromised on the bottom, it acts as its own kind of hydraulic rocket. And so it basically sprays a bunch of mass out the bottom through this new hole and the entire hydrogen tank within the external tank blows upwards and it crushes into the oxygen tank above it and compromises the oxygen tank too. And so near this same point, and all of this on the timeline is now happening within about two seconds, all of these events happen. So near that same time, that connector between the SRB and the external tank that had the flame on it it also fails. And that right-hand SRB that had the joint spraying fire out of it begins to rotate 
around its upper connection. So now it's rotating relative to the rest of the shuttle stack, which it should never do. The nozzle at the bottom would be headed away from the shuttle stack, and the nose cone of the SRB would be headed towards it. Correct. And, and so the telemeter data that was sent to the ground bore this out. It showed that the attitude of the SRB was diverging from the attitude of the rest of the shuttle stack. It showed that the SRB computer understood this and was moving its nozzle to try to counteract it. It showed that the shuttle saw that it was getting a force that was off to the side. It was getting essentially a very large yaw force. And the main engine nozzles were swiveling to counteract it. But very quickly, the, the nose of that SRB impacted the external tank too. Mm. And now you've had two large damaging events on the external tank, and you've got this large force that is off-center pressing against the entire shuttle stack. And so the whole shuttle stack is moving at, I think, about Mach 3 at this point, and it's still in some atmosphere, and the effect of that is that its trajectory gets upset, and when it does, the whole thing disintegrates because it's not designed to take loads laterally, it's only designed to take loads longitudinally. And so when you upset its attitude, basically when its attitude is no longer parallel to its velocity vector, then you end up breaking apart, because now you're seeing a bunch of loads on surfaces that weren't designed to take them. And so the entire stack disintegrates then. The oxygen and the hydrogen in the external tank mix, and that's where the big cloud of vapor comes from in the film. The hydrazine in the orbiter reacts, the two components react, and that's where the fire on the film comes from. And that's more or less the end of the sequence of events. So you, you've ended up with this, this joint that experienced this blow by at the beginning and then sealed for a little while and then the seal was knocked loose, this putty that just fortuitously closed up this gap where the, the O-ring burn by was. But then it that failed, and the whole stack was compromised and disintegrated in the air. So say somebody had somehow considered this failure mode and noticed the puff of smoke at the ground. Is there anything that anyone could have done at that point? No, NASA had, at the time and even later, even to the end of the shuttle program, there was no contingency for escaping a disaster while the solid rocket boosters were still burning. And you couldn't just jettison the solid rocket boosters at any time because the entire stack would not have had enough velocity to do anything. Hmm. Even to the day of the last shuttle flight, there was no contingency for any of this stuff while the solid rocket boosters were still attached to the stack and still burning. So even if someone had noticed it, even if someone in mission control, even if the flight director had noticed it on the film as it was launching, there's nothing he could have done. So at, at the point where those solid rocket boosters ignited and the puffs of smoke came out, the fate of everything was sealed. It was going to explode. So... This kind of brings us to a person I wanted to talk about in this story. He's a guy by the name of Roger Beaujolais, and he was an engineer for Morden Thiokol, and he worked on the Solid Rocket Booster program. And a year previous to the Challenger blowing up, in January of 1985, there was a launch in cold weather. And at the time of that launch in 1985, it was the coldest shuttle launch they had ever done. It was something, I believe, like 52 degrees, I think. And they launched, and the vehicle got to orbit, and everything was fine. The solid rocket boosters had been jettisoned during the ascent. They were picked up out of the ocean, shipped back to Mordenthiakal in Utah. And upon inspection, Roger Beaujolais finds that the O-rings in one of the fuel joints have burned through or nearly burned through 
I believe. They failed either way because the O-rings were not designed to burn through at all. They were designed to seal correctly and the putty would back them up. The putty would keep the gas from touching them. And so any burning of the O-rings was a failure of the design. And so he became very worried. And so he spent all of 1985 trying to convince first the engineers he worked with, and then their management, and then the upper management at Mordenthiokol, and then the management at NASA, that this was a big problem, that this was a bad design, and that eventually someone would die because of this, and a vehicle would be lost. And so he spends this whole year before the Challenger is launched in January of 1986, trying to get traction. And over the course of the year, he does convince the engineers he works with. He convinces the chief engineer of the solid rocket booster program at Morton Thiokol. And he starts to get some traction within NASA. And the big issue was that these O-rings lost their resiliency at cold temperature. And this launch in 1985, again, it had been at, I think, 52 degrees. And so the resiliency was really bad. When, when this Tang and Clevis joint would flex as the solid rocket boosters were ignited, the O-ring was not able to fully fill that new gap fast enough. And so gas blew by. And then further up upon ascent, in the vibrational environment, more gas was allowed to flow by. And so he was warning that any launch in cold weather could cause a catastrophic failure of the solid rocket boosters at any of the field joints. So it comes around to January of 1986, and it comes to literally the night before Challenger launches. And they get the weather report. Roger Beaujolais looks at the, re the weather report. And he sees that the temperature for the launch is forecast to be something like 22 degrees. And so it's at like 30 degrees lower than the coldest launch they've ever done. And that coldest launch showed failure of the O-rings itself. And so he does his best to try to sound the alarm basically and get NASA to postpone the launch for warmer weather. Wow. So there's there's a there's a lot of history around this and and the commission that investigated the the accident had Roger Beaujolais testify. He went against the orders of the Mordenthia call attorneys who told him to just answer questions that were of an engineering nature in an engineering way. Basically, don't go outside of your expertise and don't give your opinions or anything. And when he got to the commission, he basically said, you know, the, the lawyers have told me not to really say anything, but I'll answer any question you've got. And he really spilled the beans to the commission about the, the malfeasance and the bad judgment of other people involved. But that was later at the, the investigation. The night before the launch, he has a meeting with his engineers and his management at Mordenthiokol. And he finally convinces his management that this isn't safe. It's outside of our database. We don't understand the true effects, and we think that it could end catastrophically. And so for a while, he has Mordenthiokol management on his side. So then they get on a phone call with NASA mis mission management, and they present a set of slides explaining their data. And NASA basically does something that they would become famous for after this investigation. It became known as normalizing risk. And so they would, they would look at something like O-ring blow-by. And they would say, look, when you launched last year at 52 degrees, the coldest launch we've ever done, the O-ring only eroded one-third of its thickness. It still had two-thirds of its thickness left. And so NASA would rationalize that that gave them a margin of safety or a factor of safety of three. And the reality is the O-ring is not supposed to erode at all. So 
if it erodes any, it has failed. Even if the SRB does not blow up and destroy the shuttle and kill the crew, the O-ring and the design, the joint design, have still failed. Mm -hmm. But NASA NASA would do this, and, and the investigators found case after case after case where NASA had done this, where they would take something that was a failure by the criteria of the design, and then they would say, but nobody died, so it must be safe. And then that would become their new baseline that they would operate from. And they would say, anything that isn't that bad is fine. And if it's worse than that, maybe we can rationalize why it's okay to do too. And so NASA did that with, with the Morton Thiokol engineers on the phone that night. They said, look, at, at, at 52 degrees, we the thing worked. And your data itself, you, you don't have hard data that it will fail. Basically, they said that Morton Thiokol could not prove it would fail. And so that was good enough. That's solid engineering right there. Yeah, it's it's some pretty piss poor engineering, but <laughs> <laughs> and so what happens is the NASA mission managers at one point in this phone call, they decide to defer they they asked for the opinion of this person on the call, and he was a, a NASA civil servant engineer from one of the centers in California. I can't remember Marshall, I think. It's Marshall in California. I don't know. I don't know. It doesn't matter. I'm, I'm pretty sure he was from Marshall Space Flight Center. And so he was this very, very well-respected engineer on the space shuttle program and and this very senior and learned guy. And, and you know, he was one of these guys who doesn't talk much. And when he talks, everybody listens to him. And, and they asked him what he thought. And his response was, I am appalled by Morden Thiokol's insistence that we not launch, but I will not go against the contractor. Basically, in my interpretation of that is, he thought they should launch, and he said, I'm appalled, which basically gives a signal to all the rest of the NASA guys that, hey, this dude says that Morden Thiokol's decision is bad. But then the dude also says, but I wouldn't override the contractor's decision, which is basically covering his own ass. And so it it's kind of like he gave the other NASA guys on the phone cover to override the contractor. And so they they argue back and forth for a while longer. And then the senior vice president of engineering for Morden Thiokol comes into the meeting into the room in Utah where the Morden Thiokol guys are. And he says, let's, he, he asks NASA if they can have a five minute sidebar conversation. So they, they mute the call and they have a conversation. And basically the senior vice president of engineering bullies everybody into telling NASA that it's safe to launch. At the time that this was going on all through 1985, when, when, Roger Beaujolais was trying to raise these concerns. One of the reasons that Morden Thiokol was so uninterested in what he had to say was that they spent the entire year negotiating with NASA for the follow-on contract to continue providing solid rocket boosters to the space shuttle program. And at the time, it was like a billion-dollar contract. It was a lot of business for Morden Thiokol. And they didn't want to upset that contract by telling NASA, hey, that joint you paid us to design, it's incredibly dangerous. You need to pay us to redesign it again. And so that's what eventually won the day on the Morden Thiokol side. It was the business decision to not upset NASA during the, the final stages of this contract negotiation in January of 1986. And so... So what's NASA's motivation here? NASA's trying to stick to a schedule. They they were under a lot of a lot of pressure to launch shuttles quickly. And in 1985, I believe they launched 9 shuttles. It it was the most they had ever launched and the manifest for 1986 had 12 launches on it. 
And so they were they they believe that sticking to the schedule was the most important thing. And their entire management culture revolved around that. And that's what allowed this normalized risk to start happening. So the Morton Thiokol guys come back from their little five minute sidebar and basically say, our official position is now that our data is inconclusive. And the NASA mission manager said, great, we're going to launch. So that was the end of it. And the next day, as Roger Beaujolais tells the story, he sat on his couch in his living room with his wife and watched the launch. And he and his fellow engineers had thought that the solid rocket booster would blow up on the pad. And they thought that the cold temperature would take all the resiliency out of the O-ring, that the blow-by upon ignition of the solid rocket booster would be so bad that the, the booster itself would blow up on the pad upon ignition and detonate the entire shuttle stack. So he was watching the launch on his couch in his living room with his wife, and the the shuttle lifted off and cleared the launch pad, and, and as he tells it, he breathed a sigh of relief, and he thought, okay, they're fine. And then 73 seconds later, they blew up. So, um, ultimately, he was right, and the Accident Investigation Commission leaned heavily on him and his analysis and his testimony in essentially condemning NASA and saying that one of the greater motivators for, or greater causes of this, this accident was NASA's management and NASA's attitude towards safety, its attitude towards normalizing risk and putting the schedule ahead of everything else. So during Roger Beaujolais' testimony, there was a famous moment from Richard Feynman. And Richard Feynman's a, a Nobel Prize winning physicist. He worked on the Manhattan Project during World War II. And he was asked to be on the investigation commission, kind of to give it a lot of legitimacy. He was a semi-famous kind of public figure, certainly not as famous as Carl Sagan, but he was kind of Carl Sagan before Carl Sagan was Carl Sagan, you know? He was kind of like, he was very witty, he was very well-spoken, he could communicate really well, and he was incredibly smart, and a lot of people knew who he was. And so they felt that putting him on the investigation committee would give it a lot of credibility. And so he got there, and it it's interesting, I, I listened to some interviews with Carl Sagan, or sorry, with Richard Feynman, talking about being on the Accident Investigation Committee. And and I think one of the things he really brought that was important was he was a physicist. And he was this, you know, very important theoretical physicist of the 20th century. And, and he had a certain disdain for engineering and engineers. And I thought that was really important because he would, he would, take this very skeptical view of what they were saying that I think maybe even he would not have taken towards other things. And, and so he, it, it's almost as if he, he may have had a very weak vendetta or, or something. And, and he just, the way he talks about the engineers, he, you can feel that he really does have disdain for them. And, and that was really important because he was going around to these different space centers at NASA and interviewing engineers working on the shuttle program. And he would interview their management. And these were really kind of informal conversations, more so than interviews. And what he found was that there was an incredible difference between what the engineers thought the reliability of certain components of the space shuttle was and what their management thought the reliability was. And so the engineers he talked to might say, yeah, I, I think a shuttle will be destroyed every hundred flights. And the management, as you got higher up in management, the estimates became more and more whimsical 
to the point where the top management of NASA said, I think a shuttle would be destroyed once every 100,000 flights. To which Richard Feynman wrote something along the lines of, you know, think about this, one in 100,000 flights, it means you could launch a shuttle every day for 300 years and not lose one. And how would you even estimate that number? How could you rationally come to an estimation of one in 100,000? Because uh, imagine you're doing something that has a chance to fail and you just do it over and over and over and over again. You're not measuring the chance to fail when you succeed over and over and over again. You need some failures in there to actually measure to see what the chance of failure is. And so all you're getting, all you're able to say when you have a long string of successes is that the chance of failure is much less than one in however many times you've tried. That's the best you can say. No, that's that's not quite accurate. We'll do the typical statistics thing. Say I have an urn and it has white and black balls in it and the black balls represent failure and you don't know how many of each color is in there and it just has limitless balls it has like infinity balls so you start drawing balls from this urn and you just draw white ball after white ball what is the probability or what is the fraction of balls that are black and white like say you draw 100 white ones you don't think you can't tell at all what the fraction is you you know that the you know that the fraction of white white balls is very high that's all you can say no, you, you can calculate this, like, I mean, there exists math to calculate this. It, it's something that can be calculated. You can figure out what the probability is. Every time you draw a white ball, the expected fraction of white versus black goes up, and it goes up by more than one white ball. Right, and that's what he, that's what he said, is that, is that all you can tell is that the chance of failure is much less than one in whatever number of tests you've done. Yeah. Yeah, that's what he said. How many launches had they had at that point? Challenger was the 25th launch. Yeah, so you'd expect that it's probably better than losing one out of 25 at that point. Yeah, yeah. But it's probably not one in 100,000. Yeah, and and so that was his criticism. It was, well, you, you really can't, with only 25 launches under your belt, you have no basis to say that the chance of failure is one in a hundred thousand. Yeah. That's, it's simply, it, it's entirely a made up number. You're just deciding that that's a number that you would like it to be. And so you say, that's what you think it is, but there is no rational defense of that number. Yeah. I can, I can imagine some kind of extremely robust process where you're, you're analyzing all this data that comes back and you're continuously fixing things that you think could potentially be a problem. And so you're like, every time we launch, our probability of failure is going down and we haven't even had a failure. And then maybe, maybe you could say, okay, I think we're, it's getting up into the stratosphere, but they definitely weren't doing that. In fact, it sounds like they were making the launches riskier and riskier. Right. They were. And, and so this, this kind of magical thinking about safety and how safe the vehicles were, it still exists at NASA today. When I was still there, they were trying to spin up the Constellation program. And so they had the Orion crew capsule. And one of the things that NASA said is that it'll be three times as safe as the shuttle. And it's like, you guys aren't even done designing it yet. How can you say it's going to be three times as safe as the shuttle? <laughs> like, is there any rational defense of that statement? We're all engineers here. It's one of the bullet points on our presentation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's right there in black and white. <laughs> Was it James Mattis who said PowerPoint makes us stupid? I'm not sure who said that. So... <laughs> You know, that kind of crazy thinking is still going on at NASA today, that that we can just declare chances of failure and somehow they're real. Somehow our declaration matters. Somehow nature is contorted into obeying our declaration. <laughs>
And if only they had a prediction market. Yeah. <laughs> they probably wouldn't like the idea of betting on the shuttle exploding. That would be interesting to see a prediction market where all the engineers at NASA participated and they all just bet on <laughs> they they just predicted the the chance of any given watch resulting in the death of a crew. I think a lot of people would not be happy with that. It would make people uneasy, but I think it would have great value. <laughs> That's precisely the problem. <laughs> so let's see, where were we in the story now? You were talking about Richard Feynman. Yeah. So at one point, they're they're having this committee meeting, and Roger Beaujolais, the Mordenthiacol engineer, is there testifying. And Richard Feynman is up at the front of the room with other committee members questioning him. And Roger Beaujolais is giving this discussion about O-ring resiliency and cold temperature. And Richard Feynman takes a piece of actual O-ring material that he had, and he puts it in a glass of ice water. And he had done this kind of, you know, without anyone noticing, he had put it in this glass of ice water that was sitting in front of him. And so as Roger Beaujolais is talking, at, at one point, Richard Feynman says, so I... You know, he says he'd, he'd like to demonstrate something here and he pulls it out and he shows that it has no resiliency at 32 degrees. And they believe that the section of O-ring that actually burned through on Challenger and caused the destruction of the vehicle was at about 25 degrees upon launch. So the atmospheric temperature had been higher than the forecast from the night before but the section of the SRB that that O-ring was at, that that portion of the O-ring that burned out was at, was in the shadow. So it was not lit by the sun directly. And so it was not as warm as, as sections of the O-ring on the opposite side of the SRB. Hmm. And so they their, their estimates from this you know thermal modeling they had done from a bunch of, I guess forensic meteorology was that that bit of o-ring was about 25 degrees at launch and so richard Feynman does this this great half stunt but you know half legitimate neat demonstration where he sits up in front of everyone and he shows well we know this is 32 degrees because i just had it in a glass of ice water and it has no resiliency and the shuttle was launched with o-ring at seven degrees colder than this and so he perfectly backed up roger beaujolais there showing that here's what the problem is for anyone in the room who may not understand what's going on and it, it was one of those brilliant moments so richard Feynman would go on to write something called the appendix f to the challenger accident investigation report which is something that Blake and I recommend that all engineers and all scientists and basically any smart person should read. It's incredibly informative and it's incredibly insightful in the topics we've just been discussing about the odds of failure, about cultural problems within companies where you'll have differences between engineers' opinions and management's opinions and understandings and the kinds of communication roadblocks that will cause those. So he would go on to write that. It would be included as an appendix. There's there's various histories suggesting why it was an appendix. There's kind of the dramatic history where he and the chairman of the Rogers Commission or the, the Accident Investigation Commission, it was sometimes referred to as the Rogers Commission. He and the chairman had this basically a fight over the appendix F and Feynman threatened to remove his name from the entire report if it was not included because he felt the report was not critical enough of NASA's management. And upon his threat of removing his, his name from the whole report, the chairman of the commission said, okay, well, we can include your thing, but we're going to put it in the appendix and hopefully no one will read it. But it turns out to be one of the most brilliant parts of of the report it's it's very insightful so there's there's one more thing i wanted to talk about with relation to the challenger 
And that is what happened to the astronauts. So the shuttle was launched with seven astronauts and they all died. And NASA's official position from the day of the accident was they were killed in the explosion. And again, the the stack didn't really explode. It disintegrated due to, to aerodynamic loads. And some of the fuel mixed and it kind of locally exploded. But the crew cabin can be seen flying free of the rest of the debris on the footage. And so there, there's in in the high speed footage with the image cleaned up, they've they can actually positively identify the large piece, which is the the front of the shuttle orbiter, which has the flight deck and the mid deck where all the astronauts sit. And they can positively identify that it came out of the explosion in one piece. And so it's very easy for NASA at the time. It was very easy for NASA to tell everybody, hey, you saw a big explosion. We saw a big explosion. It just killed them instantly. Don't worry about it. And over the years, people started to become skeptical of that. And a lot of people did analysis NASA did some of its own analysis, which through FOIAs and lawsuits, they eventually had to release. And one of the interesting conclusions was when the vehicle broke up and all of the oxygen and the hydrogen fuel in the external tank mixed, the pressure wave from that mixing would have only been about three PSI on the separated crew compartment. So the actual impact that the crew would have felt from the breakup of the shuttle stack was very small. In fact, it was less than the G-forces that they would have experienced during certain points of the ascent of the shuttle. So it's very unlikely, and, and really, it's, it's not possible at all. I hate to say that, but it's incredibly unlikely that they died when the stack broke apart. Though NASA has always said that's what happened. Stop thinking about it. Let's quit talking about this. Hmm. So the whole shuttle stack was on a trajectory up into orbit at the time. And so when the crew compartment broke free of the rest of the shuttle, it continued on a parabolic trajectory upwards. And it maxed out about 65,000 feet. And so the argument now turns to, did the crew cabin lose pressure upon breakup of the orbiter? And there's quite a bit of disagreement about whether or not it lost pressure. So at that time in 1986, the shuttle crew just wore cheesy cloth flight suits. They didn't wear any type of space suit or... or anything special, really. It was simply a cloth suit. It's the same material that people who work in chemical plants wear that, you know, resists fire and will, I believe, shrink towards your skin if it encounters a flame, something like that. Is it Nomex? Yes, it's Nomex. I was thinking something with an N, and I was thinking neoprene, and I was like, it's not neoprene. But I couldn't remember. Yeah, Nomex. And so they would just wear those, and then they would wear a helmet over it but the helmet didn't even seal to the cloth suit. And the argument is, if the crew compartment, as it broke free from the rest of the, the shuttle stack, if it maintained cabin pressure, then they probably would not have lost consciousness. And so from the time of the breakup, when they would have stopped receiving pressurized air through their helmets until the point when the crew cabin had fallen it you know it had it had gone up to the apogee of its trajectory and then started its descent back towards the ocean and then by the time it would have fallen to an altitude where you will not lose consciousness from not having any pressurized air supply would have taken i believe it's like 
two minutes or something like that. And so if the, if the cabin had lost pressure instantly, they probably would have all passed out in that period. And they would have probably not had time to regain consciousness before the crew cabin hit the ocean. Now, if the crew cabin did not lose pressure, or if it only had a slow leak and it started losing pressure gradually, it's much more likely that they didn't lose consciousness. Now, there, there is some evidence that they were not killed instantly. So there were certain switches that were actuated in the cockpit. So when the vehicle broke apart, at some discrete point in time, it radioed down its last data of what the state of the orbiter was. But then when they recovered the crew cabin, they found that certain switches disagreed with that last state of the orbiter, of the data rather. And so what they know from that is that in between the time they lost the ability to transmit data to the ground and the time when it impacted the ocean and definitely killed everyone on board, there were people throwing switches and trying to do things inside the orbiter. So it's, it's, we definitely know that at least some of them survived the breakup. There's a second piece of evidence, too. Each of the astronauts had something called a personal emergency air pack, and it, it was abbreviated PEEP. And four, three of the four PEEPs that were recovered from the wreckage had been activated. And they believe that the a single person on the flight deck activated their own activated the pilots because it was mounted on the seat behind the pilot and then activated someone else's the commander's pack was not activated but it was under his seat in a place that was hard to reach the peeps belonging to the three people on the mid deck were not recovered so they don't know if those were activated or not so there is positive evidence that they survived the initial breakup of the vehicle now the peeps were designed not to provide you with consciousness at high altitude. They were designed to provide the astronauts with breathing air if they had to exit the vehicle on the launch pad. And so in some imaginable contingency where they need to get out of the space shuttle and ride that zip line down to the APC on the ground and slowly drive the APC away from the shuttle, the PEEP would provide pressurized air, but not pressurized oxygen. It was just an air system. And so it would have been ineffective at keeping them conscious if the crew cabin pressure was breached. So it just pumped in ambient air? Yes, it, it had compressed air in a bottle, and it would just oh, it okay. pro probably just had a regulator and it would just slowly let that, that air bleed off into their helmet. So it would not have been enough to maintain consciousness at 65,000 feet if the pressure in the crew cabin was breached. Now, I read something written by a guy who used to work in one of the shuttle processing facilities at Kennedy Space Center. And he said that they would do static pressure tests on the entire crew cabin. And he said that those things were locked up tight. They were very good. They would not leak at all or not on any appreciable scale. And so he was personally very skeptical as someone who worked on the, on the space shuttle, on the crew cabin, and had experience with pressure testing the crew cabin. He believed that given the small forces that the crew cabin was exposed to during the breakup, it's very likely that it maintained pressure. If it did, then it means that all the astronauts were conscious the entire time after the breakup until it hit the ocean and killed them all. Hmm. Well, that sucks for them. Yeah. And... As time goes on, that belief is becoming more and more mainstream. 
I think the arguments are getting better. I think we've probably gotten all the data from NASA that exists. There, there was a lot of kind of low-level incompetent cover-up that NASA did at the time to kind of prevent people from ever thinking otherwise than that the crew was killed instantly upon breakup of the vehicle. But it's becoming more and more accepted that they were probably all alive and very likely they were conscious the whole ride up to Apogee and then down to the ocean. When the crew cabin was actually found six weeks after the disaster, it was found in about 90 feet of water and they recovered the bodies from it and after six weeks in the ocean, they were in pretty rough shape. But NASA did its best to make sure that no one would see the bodies. The medical examiner for the county that Kennedy Space Center is in was never allowed to examine the bodies. So he never issued a death certificate. NASA took it under its own power to issue a death certificate for the astronauts which is kind of a weird power for NASA to claim to have. Basically, they they literally just typed up some pieces of paper that said, like, this certifies that such and such astronaut, a male slash female born this date, died such and such date. And they did that so that the families could present those to, like, life insurance companies and, and other things, you know, to get power of attorney and, and all these other things that you need. But it's unclear that anyone ever issued a legal death certificate for the astronauts, even to this day. Hmm. So they're still not legally dead. Yeah, it's it is not apparent that they are. Do you have any questions? Yeah, so. Going back to the O-ring failure, let's say NASA had taken this more seriously. Do you think that they could have built heaters and heated all of the field connections on the SRBs and then had the heaters either removed right at launch or just before launch? Would that have been sufficient? Yeah, I think so. It would have been really easy to build little insulating blankets with wires running through them and then keep it heated to like a cozy 100 degrees or something like yeah. that right at all the joints. I, I think that definitely would have been a good option to consider if NASA had taken this seriously, then I think that would have been something high on the list of possible solutions. After the Challenger accident, what they eventually did was completely redesign the field joint. It seems like what it needed to be was a weld. Yeah. I know you're welding next to rocket fuel, <laughs> but it seems like there's some way to set it up where... A weld can be done. That sounds incredibly dangerous. Because <laughs> this, <laughs> this rocket fuel provides its own oxidizer. Yeah. So all it needs is heat. But right in the vicinity of this joint, there's not any rocket fuel. Right. And there's a lot of insulation. There's another insulation layer between the rocket fuel and the sheet metal of the, the segment itself. Yeah. So it seems like you could set up bounds on... Like you, you can heat it this much, you can do this much welding, and then you put a rig on the rocket that's going to do a weld and just automatically drive itself around the entire segment. And then you turn it on with a one minute delay and then everyone gets clear. And then this automated <laughs> system welds it and you don't expect it to blow up, but that way no one gets, no one is risked in the weld. Yeah. Yeah. And if it does blow up, all you lose is one solid rocket booster. Yeah. Well, two two segments. Yeah. I I like the blanket idea better. <laughs> because I, I feel like you probably could have built the blankets and you would have had a couple of choices. It would have been, do we leave the blankets on during ascent? They can become debris. So that's maybe a bad idea. Or we have to design some really, really reliable way for them to come off. Or we have to have some way to, say, have the blankets on there and they're cranked up to this high temperature. And then we have a way to pull them off on the ground and like 
one guy yanks them all off real quick and he like bundles <laughs> them up and he puts them in the APC and then he drives away. And and he does that at like T minus two minutes or something, you know? They have kites attached to them and he pulls the pin and then the kite lets him fly away. I was actually imagining the equivalent of like a guy does it. Like you have a, a pin that's holding it all together and a long cable that runs down to the ground and someone can manually remove it. Yeah. The thing is, I think they could remove it very, very long before the launch, like 10 minutes, 20 minutes. Yeah, I think so, too. If you're at the level of design where it's a pin actuated by a cable and then, you know, the whole rest of the blanket is just yanked off by another cable. All you have to do is like put a winch connected to it and have a bunch of like winches that just pull these cables and wind them up. So you don't even need extra people. Yeah, that sounds pretty reasonable. Yeah. I think a lot of things would have been different if NASA had taken this seriously. I mean, initially what they would have done is just not launch until they were back within the safe window of temperatures, which was higher than 52. Because when they launched in January of 1985 at 52 degrees, that was outside of what they thought was safe, what Morden Thiokol thought was safe at the time. Mm. And because no one died, now NASA reset its expectation of where safety was. And it said, now 52 is safe. How far below that can we go? They probably would have just lost a different shuttle. Yeah. Yeah. We know, we know that happened at least once. So after Roger Beaujolais gave all this testimony, he was essentially blackballed by his company and his co-workers. That, that was the other question I had. Yeah, he, he was essentially blackballed and he quit Morden Thiokol about two or three months later. Nobody wanted to work with him and he was actually out of work. Like he did not work as an engineer again. And Something I read about it basically said, yeah, can you blame anyone? Because imagine you're an engineering company and Roger Beaujolais comes in interviews and you're just sitting there thinking, well, I wonder when this guy will discover some like totally program destroying problem with our design and ruin everything for us. It's better if we just don't know. Maybe we'll get lucky. And so... He would eventually become a lecturer on the subject of business ethics and engineering ethics and things like that. And he would just lecture about that the rest of his life. It seems like a lot of firms, well, at least firms that exist now, would want him. Yeah, the, the attitude at the time was not that way. I wonder if that had more to do with, with people having such high regard for NASA and this guy being the guy who kind of spoiled stuff for NASA, you know, much more than it had to do with, well, he made the correct call. Like, he really was the, the model of ethics in this whole thing. Mm -hmm. He stood like a rock. Yeah, he made the correct call. He he notified people in, like, theoretically the right chain. Like, he didn't go outside the chain and write, like, the Beaujolais memo directly to NASA or something like has sometimes happened in history. He did everything according to the process, except for, I guess, the accident investigation part. Yeah. But then it had already happened. And yeah, and he, he caught this failure. So I feel like to some extent, though, he probably did not realize what options he had available to him at the time. Like he probably didn't realize that he now had this personal brand as the person who can who's who, who will catch these failures and will report them and he didn't know how to shop himself around to their companies that would care about it yeah because probably there was one yeah like imagine a, a penetration testing firm mm -hmm. they would probably want him yeah the other thing i was going to ask was so did a lot of did criminal charges get filed against anyone at nasa did a bunch of nasa people no. get fired was management reorganized? Uh, you know, it probably some guys had to swap offices, if I had to bet. But no, nobody was ever charged. No one went to jail. No one was punished. The 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 director of the accident investigation committee basically said, "We can't find anyone to blame." <laughs>
Which is really weird because, I mean, I read the accident investigation report. I I skipped reading all the testimony. It's in the report. But I'm sure if you read the testimony, you could start coming up with a list of people who should probably, at the very least, have been fired. I bet you could come up with a few who probably should have gone to jail. So let this be a lesson to engineers. You're untouchable. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly the lesson you should take. You can kill seven people and destroy a $2 billion space shuttle. And you might have to change offices. Only if you're in management. Yeah. So next time, I think we're going to talk about the Columbia and the loss of it and its crew. Sounds like a fun time. <laughs> Spoilers, we know exactly when they all died. And this is fun engineering. 